and welcome to the Roth Living Showroom here um, featuring Sub-Zero Wolf and Cove products. I am Executive Chef Ben Davis. I am the Executive Chef here in Denver and I will be leading you through this ownership session for your Wolf Dual Fuel Range or your Wolf Sealed, uh, sealed Range uh, range top. Um, we'll go through everything we can talk about, uh, how we use them, the functionality of everything, and then also um, explore a little bit about the care, cleaning, and maintenance of these appliances as well. Um, please make sure that if you have a question, um, to use the chat feature on your Zoom call um, to type your question is in into the uh, chat feature. Lynn Thielen, who is our uh, showroom manager here in Denver, is behind the camera, and she will be really laying those questions to me in real time so we can get those questions that you might have answered um, as quickly as possible. Um, and uh, should you have any other questions, you can obviously always reach out to us here at Roth Living so that we can answer those questions for you uh, into the future as well. So um, what we'll really start covering today when we start, we're gonna start talking about our dual fuel ranges. Now, obviously dual fuel is the best of both worlds. We have a completely gas range top with electrically powered ovens underneath. Um, for a more detailed description of all the functionality of your Wolf dual fuel oven, um, we would ask you to refer to last week's video, um, which was on the E series and M series wall ovens. The E series is essentially exactly the same oven that you have underneath um, your dual fuel range. We will talk about the interface um, with your dual fuel today, but essentially all the discussion of the different baking and roasting modes, proofing, dehydration, and even oven cleaning are gonna be uh, explained in great detail in last week's oven video. So we certainly encourage you to, to visit our YouTube site um, to, to see that if you need more about the functionality of ovens. But we really wanna be able to talk about all the different um, use and care items when we're talking about the top of the oven and also talking about those sealed range tops as well. So um, again, remember that all of our, uh, all of the uh, uh, dual fuel ovens come in three or four, excuse me, sizes, um, 30, 36, 48, and 60 inch widths. Um, and when we talk about the burner functionality and the different configurations, that's gonna be available. Um, you know, only limited by the size um, in that in, in that instance. So you can um, take advantage of understanding all of what we're gonna be talking about today with each burner. So they're all gonna be the same. There's not gonna be a difference. We'll talk about induction at the end and talk about the induction cooktop and the functionality of the induction. For those of you who own an induction range or an induction cooktop, we'll definitely talk about that when we get to the end of this segment on gas. So um, again, let's uh, look at our dual fuels and talk about um, just the oven functionality and how you use the ovens. It's a little different than our wall ovens. Um, you guys are probably all used to this by now, but you know that you have um, the bezel, the two-part bezel on the front of your oven that allows you to access the different cooking and roasting modes, baking and roasting modes that are in there, obviously by turning the bezel to the modes that that where the function starts. Um, the, the modes that are listed outside of the little black box, those are what I like to call the still modes, or the modes that are not accessing the fan, right? So again, bake, broil, roast, and the stone mode are all the, the modes where you are not using the fans at all. So the still modes, and then the modes that we're using the fan, the convection modes, again, is convection, convection roast, convection broil, and convection bake. These are all the modes that are displayed on the bezel in addition to the clean mode. And obviously, you simply access them by turning the bezel to the mode that you desire to cook in, and then you use this other part of the knob to set the temperature by turning up or down, depending on where you would like your temperature. Um, so if you want to set, say, bake at 375, you just click until you reach 375, and then the oven will preheat. And remember, just as we explained last week in the, in the um, video about the ovens, um, you will always hear the fans running during the preheat cycle to both accelerate, um, the preheat cycle, but also to make sure that we get complete preheating throughout the oven cavity, so that when you do introduce the foods into that cavity, you are baking at the in the mode and at the temperature that you desire and not in a mode that may not suit what it is you're cooking. So again, that's the best way to interface it. Remember too, there are two hidden modes um, that are accessed through the bezel as well. 
Those are the proof and dehydrate modes, um, easily accessed when you set um, the bezel into the bake mode. You can then turn the knob down so that you reach the very low end of the spectrum of temperature, which in this case is 170 degrees. Once you reach 170 in that um, process, the, um, it will automatically flip over to the PRF symbol, which tells you that you are now in proof mode. So now you may set your temperature range from between 85 and 110 degrees so that you may allow your doughs to rise um, in a very gentle and controlled manner in the oven cavity. Um, dehydration mode is accessed in exactly the same way, except that when we set um, the oven to convection and then take it all the way down to the bottom of that heating um, range and then flip it one more time, you're now in the dehydration mode. Dehydration mode has a nice range of 125 to 185 degrees, but the real important part about dehydration mode is that the fan will never turn off throughout the cycle, whether the door is open or closed, the fan will be running. It's generally a good idea to prop the oven door, um, either with the stopper that comes with the dehydration kit, which is available you know, from Wolf, or you can use, as I like to use, I like to use an old wine stopper um, to keep the door propped open. So you allow as much of the excess moisture to be vented from the oven so that when you're dehydrating something, you're going to get uh, the quickest possible dehydration possible. But those are the two hidden modes that are right there on your bezel. Again, proof is under the bake mode at the very bottom of the, uh, the heating um, scale, and then also dehydration at the bottom of the convection mode, and, and then at the very bottom, and then taken over to dehydration. So there's all the way we access with the oven. Remember, your oven um, is functionality is just the same as your wall ovens in terms of how the racks are taken in or out. One of the nice features of the ovens in, in this case is the fact that we put these steel rails on the door so that this bottom rack can be extended fully onto the oven door so that if you're baking something large in the oven, you can easily access it to do some basting or some turning. But it, remember that you do have that rack, just like in our E-Series oven, that is designed to fit in that bottom most position. So again, for any more inf uh, information on utilizing your oven, whether it's a rack operation or the different um, uh, modes and how they are form uh, performing while you're using them, just refer to last week's video. I think you'll find that there's a lot of good information there about using your ovens, all right? So let's talk a little bit now about the Wolf sealed gas burners that are standard on not only on all of our dual fuel ranges, but also on our sealed range tops as well. Um, just remember that all a range top really is, is this dual fuel oven with the oven removed, and then we just are left with the, with the top most part of the range, okay? All of our ranges are configured in a very similar manner, whether you have a 60 inch range or a 30 inch range, when you're standing at the range, um, the burner that will be the most powerful, in other words, the burner that you're going to use for boiling water to cook pasta, or maybe you're going to do some wok cooking or some very high heat cooking. As you're standing at your range, that'll always be the burner in the lower left corner. In all instances, this burner is 20,000 BTUs of power, right, providing you the greatest uh, ability to boil your water quickly and all those kinds of things. That's where you're going to get your most power is always that lower left. That's always easy to remember because it's always paired with the very small simmer or melt burner, which is in the upper left corner. That burner is 9,500 BTUs, right? So it's obviously the smallest burner on your range top or on your dual fuel range. So obviously that's going to be used for the most delicate processes that you might undertake, whether it's melting chocolate or melting butter, holding a delicate sauce that you've prepared. One of the nice things about using these ranges is that you can avoid using double boilers in almost every instance. You don't need to use a double boiler to, um, to cushion or insulate um, your pans or your delicate sauces because the heat can be so adequately or precisely controlled, I should say, on that low burner in the back corner, right? So again, the, the biggest burner is always paired with the smallest burner. And then as you work in a counterclockwise direction, the burners will always descend in power um, going from left to right. So this is 18,000 this is 18,000 BTUs, and then the back two burners are both 15,000 BTUs. 
on a 30 inch range, it's going to be 20, 18, 15, and 9.5. Right? So it's always going to be in that pattern. And remember that on most ranges, the maximum number of burners that you can get are going to be six, right? So even on a 48 inch, you may have just six burners or even on the 60 inch, you may have six burners, but they're always going to go in that same direction with that same pattern of heat and power that are provided to you. Now, as you as all know, um, what, it, what one of the, makes one of the, the distinguishing factors of a wolf gas uh, dual fuel or, or, or sealed range top is the fact that we all have dual stack burners. Every burner is a dual stack burner or put another way, we have two burners in one for every single burner. As we talk about the power of each burner, we have to remember that the secondary burner or the simmer burner, if you will, that are on each one of our burners have a corresponding range of power. So in other words, the simmer burner on the 20,000 BTU burner will be slightly more powerful than the simmer burner on the 18,000 BTU burner. And likewise, the, power, it will be, the 18 will be more powerful than the 15,000 BTU burner. So what that gives you is an opportunity, depending on the density and the mass of whatever it is you're either trying to hold or simmer at one time, you can then set um, accordingly on the burner that you have. Just remember that we access all of those functionality on your knobs, right? The first set of markings on your knob is how you access the high settings, the, the top burner, if you will. And then if we push in a second time, turn it once more, we'll see the simmer settings for the burner. And that's how we control that lower burner and enable us to hold at very, very low temperatures. The other big advantage, remember, of your wolf range is that it will not turn itself on or off. It should only ignite one time and then hold whatever temperature that you've chosen indefinitely at that point without raising or lowering, but keeping it nice and steady. So just set it where you like it. As I always like to recommend, it's always better to start a little higher and then move down rather than try to slowly bring something up. So always start at a slightly higher temperature, achieve that temperature that you would like to hold at, and then move the, t the heat down on your burner. Lynn, did you have a question from someone there? Um, I have a question. If it's the sealed range top burner as well as the range burner, functions the same? They do function exactly the same. So a sealed range top burner and the burners on your dual fuel will be identical, not only in the way that they perform, but in the way that they are constructed. So you can always basically know that when we're talking about a wolf gas burner, they're all going to be the same. I mean, all that's going to differ is the varying powers um, of each one of the burners, okay? So again, you have that complete range of both simmer burners and the primary burner on each one, accessed obviously by those initial controls. But again, always remember that you just should turn it one time um, to the simmer burner. It should only hear the igniter, maybe one or two clicks to ignite it fully. Um, we'll talk a little bit about maintaining that as we get to the end, but again, it should be a very quick ignition and then turn it down very, very low. Remember that this back burner, your 9,500 BTU burner, at its lowest setting is only 300 BTUs, right, at its very lowest setting, which literally means that the burner, you can actually place your hand onto the ignited burner. I don't recommend you all do that, but you can certainly do that, and that's how low it is, and you can see how gently that will do the cooking for the very delicate items that you're preparing. So again, just remember counterclockwise with the most powerful being lower left and the least powerful being upper left and then just working backwards and you'll know. So if you have a, a burners uh, set up like these um, where you have six burners on a 36 inch dual fuel range, if you were say putting a, an aftermarket griddle uh, on, the, 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 uh, on the range, you might wanna bridge it this way because these two burners are identical in power as are the ones in the back. Yes, Lynn. Would you like the burners with the match if the power is out and the You can. The gas will still flow, so you can light it with the match. What I recommend you do is start the match first and then ignite the gas as opposed to touching the mass to the so you don't build up any gas up around the burner prior to lighting it. Just strike the match, hold it, and then turn the burner on and it will ignite very quickly. And then you run less of a chance of getting a little quick poof of the ignition on the gas, but it will function without the igniters being, if you have a power outage, the gas will still flow. So yes, it will.
So all it won't do is reignite, right? So if you, for some reason you do boil over some water and it puts out the flame for any reason, you would have to relight it manually. It won't reignite the way it normally would do um, if there was power to the unit, all right? So again, that's a quick um, coverage of just all the different burners that you have on your range, how to, you know, how to use them appropriately. Obviously remember that, very important to remember that on preheating pans and using these appliances, I generally don't recommend that unless you're boiling water or using a wok and wanting to do some very high heat cooking, that you preheat your pans over the highest flame setting. I would generally recommend heating over a medium high heat. It takes a little bit longer, but it's gonna give you a better result because you're less likely to um, denature the oil that you're cooking with. You might not burn whatever it is you're starting to, um, to, uh, to cook, so just make sure you're preheating over medium high, and then if you need to move up, but in most cases, uh, if you're searing um, some proteins, whether it's some seafood or some poultry, and you wanna sear those, you're always probably gonna wanna move down because the burners are more efficient, you're getting a really concentrated flame in there, so you're gonna probably wanna move down slightly in terms of your heat in order to give you the best possible results. So again, it's very powerful, even those 15 and 18,000 BTU um, burners are going to be very, very powerful. And if you overheat your pan a little bit, it's very easy to uh, cause your food, your cooking to go awry. All right. So, so some of the other things we want to make sure we discuss as we're talking about um, our dual fuel ranges is are the options that you have in the different appliances, if you will, that you can choose to have on your appliance as opposed to just a straight six burner configuration or a four burner configuration. But on our units that are 36, 48, or 60 inches, you have the ability to change the various ways of cooking that you can put on your, uh, on your dual fuel or your uh, sealed range top. So one of them would be the um, infrared griddle, right, which comes um, either in two different sizes. Um, so we can do the infrared griddle um, here. As you can see, it's the same width as one set of burners. This is a this is a, an appliance that is built in to the, to the, to the unit, um, so you can't remove it to clean it. Um, some people bemoan that fact, but you can't do that. Um, it is powered by a 15,000 BTU uh, infrared burner. When we say infrared burner, what we mean is that there is a ceramic plate underneath this um, um, griddle top. That um, griddle top is made of a special ceramic uh, composite that absorbs the heat of the gas burner heats up and gives you a very, very even cooking surface um, that you're going to be working on. So this is going to be one of those pieces of equipment that you're going to need to season. But you're going to need to treat it very carefully from the first day. Um, if you, if you um, haven't done that already um, or you, and you own one of these, but you are looking forward, it's a very easy process to do. Uh, the griddle is washed with a little bit of dish soap and warm water and then just rinsed off so we know that there's nothing residual remaining from the manufacturer of the griddle. Then we're going to coat it very, very lightly with a high heat cooking oil. Um, generally speaking, we like to use things like avocado, grapeseed oil, um, even some vegetable oils. You just wanna avoid any oil that might get that sort of uh, kind of tackiness to it. Um, you wanna use something that's gonna take a very high flame. Um, some people even like to use uh, vegetable shortening because it will take a fairly high flame as well. Um, but anyway, anything like that, you're going to rub about a tablespoon to two tablespoons of that onto the cooking surface. You're then going to set the temperature of the griddle using the, the thermostatically controlled knob that's right here. You can see that it runs from 100 to 450 degrees. Um, set it at 350 degrees and allow the griddle to heat up until it smokes lightly. At that point, you want to, once the smoke has started, turn the griddle off, let it cool briefly, I would say anywhere from maybe seven to 15 minutes, just until you feel like it might be safe enough to handle with a pair of tongs or work on so you're not gonna burn yourself. Take another amount of that same oil that you used the first time, again, about a tablespoon, maybe a little bit more, rub it onto the surface of the griddle with a paper towel and a pair of tongs just so you don't get too close to the hot surface. Then once you've reapplied the oil, turn the griddle back on 350 degrees and essentially let it cook for about 30 minutes. What you're basically doing is creating 
a polymerized sheet of oil so that now you're creating a non-stick surface on your griddle, all right? So after it's cooked for 30 minutes, turn the griddle off, allow it to cool down. Should you choose to, you can add another teaspoon of oil and just rub it on there. But now the griddle is ready to be cooked on, right? Remember too that it's very important when you're going to use this appliance to preheat. Um, it's gonna take anywhere, depending on the temperature that you're preheating to, but uh, kind of the middle of the road is 350 degrees. That'll take anywhere between 12 and 15 minutes to get it preheated. However, once it is preheated, it will maintain that temperature the entire day if you need it to, if you wanna keep cooking like that. And you'll know when it's attained the temperature because the little light on the front panel will then turn itself off. That light will relight itself periodically as the griddle turns the gas back on to maintain the temperature that you've selected to cook on. So again, once it's preheated, you're good to go. You don't need to fiddle with it. With the temperature, once you've established the temperature is ideal for what it is you wanna prepare, whether it might be you know, uh, searing some, some fish or making fajitas, maybe you're making pancakes, French toast, or, or uh, grilled cheese sandwiches, all of those things will work really nicely on your griddle. You're always gonna use small amounts of cooking oil on this surface as well. Um, and you don't need to um, try to use an extra amount because it really is an almost nonstick surface. Yes, Lynn? The question is, do we need to re add oil to the griddle each time we use it? Generally, it depends on the process that you're, you're undertaking. Um, in most cases, yes, minor amounts of oil. But in certain cases, because you're maintaining a level of seasoning on the oil, on the griddle, excuse me, um, by, what, by how we're using it, then there are certain cases where you don't, right? Um, generally speaking, when I'm doing things like uh, pancakes or things like that, I don't need to add any oil to my already seasoned grill because the pancakes won't stick to it when it's properly preheated. Um, but yes, small amounts for any time that you want to do what you might normally add oil to a pan um, when you're cooking on a burner, you're going to add slightly smaller amounts of oil to the griddle because it is going to be like a nonstick surface. If you treat it a lot like a cast iron skillet, a well-seasoned cast iron skillet, um, you'll know that you don't really have to add a lot of extra oil when you're cooking in your cast iron skillet. So you can do the same thing as well on the griddle. Um, as well. And so um, just know that in your um, use and care guide for your, your, your dual fuel range and also for your uh, sealed range top, um, there is a guide in the back under the griddle section, which gives you some nice temperature ranges for different preparations for the griddle. So um, if you look at that up, you look that section up, you can see that the ideal section for doing pancakes or French toast may be between 350 and 400 degrees. For doing vegetable stir fry, it's going to be hotter. Yes, Lynn? When the griddle is initially heated up, for the first few seconds, it's going to look like a Russian theater sound. Uh -huh. Does that work? It's normal because what it's doing is it's a very large burner underneath, so it's just bringing in that, oh, excuse me. Uh, the question was, is, is it normal to hear sort of a little bit of an air rushing sound in your griddle when you first ignite it? Yes, there's going to be a little bit of that as the, the big burner underneath it is igniting, right? As that gas is drawing in the oxygen in order to ignite the burner, you may hear a slight whooshing sound as you hear the few ticks of the igniter. So it is natural for it to do that. Uh, so you should expect a little bit of that. I think particularly if you're on liquid propane, you may notice a slightly different sound as well um, from your griddle, just as the nature of the two different gases um, being used to to use it, okay? So again, remember, you can use the entire surface when cooking on it. Um, it's, it's gonna heat very, very evenly, so you don't have to worry about your hot spots or cool spots throughout your griddle. And then ideally, the best product to have for use on this griddle, you can use metal utensils on this without any trouble whatsoever, um, is to have a bench knife or a, a, a dough scraper for scraping um, excess uh, food or, or grease and cooking fats down into this uh, collection tray that sits at the bottom of the griddle. This can obviously be then emptied into the, the trash once it's cool and then you can wash this in the dishwasher or just in the sink with hot soapy water without any trouble at all and then just replace that in here. Um, we'll talk a little bit about caring for your griddle near the end but uh, suffice it to say that there's a lot of ways to care for the griddle. One of the best 
um, examples of how to care for it is to go on to, again, our YouTube site at Roth Living and um, look for Chef Matt Chatfield's. Uh, he has a whole uh, video just dedicated to cleaning the griddle. Um, so you can see all of that um, in great detail on our YouTube site. So you can see a full griddle cleaning um, in real time as it's happening. Yes, Lynn, did you have another question? Um, Right. So yes, the griddle, um, really it's going to be about your level of comfort with how much you need to clean it. Um, once, like, as I said, as the griddle performs like a cast iron skillet, um, you will notice that there will be a deep brown, almost black patina of oil on the griddle. However, if you are doing um, different methods of cleaning it using um, hot, wet towels to steam clean the surface or using a small amount of oil and then an abrasive pad to scrub the surface. You're really cleaning off all the residual food that was there from the last cooking process and then scraping it down into this collection tray. So really what you're then doing is just giving a new um, layer of, of oil onto the surface. So you're actually cooking on that um, and that really promotes the non-stick qualities of the griddle. So. It really is going to depend on your level of comfort with how much you need to clean it. You can certainly clean it to the point where it'll never look like it did when it came home from the factory, but it will be a very deep silver, almost stainless steel color um, if you really go deep, deep cleaning. Um, it's not entirely necessary, in my opinion, only because that takes off a lot of that seasoning that you've built up, which gives it that really nice patina, but also the great performance of a nonstick cooking surface. So again, lots of different ways to clean it, um, but generally speaking, you can do something very, very basic, which is just the steam towel to steam clean the surface and then wipe it down, then re-oil it, or you can go as far as using a powerful chemical, which will actually strip the surface of its seasoning, and then you can start from a re-seasoning standpoint as well. But again, I would refer you to Matt's um, uh, video on the YouTube channel for a deep cleaning uh, and a deep dive into how you can maintain and care for the surface of your griddle. And know too that uh, some of you might have the double griddle um, in, your, in your setup, and those are gonna be for folks who have a 48 or 60 inch um, uh, dual fuel range or uh, sealed range top. Um, that has two independent controls, so you can either run it as one consistent temperature or do a hot side and a cooler side, and that way you can get a, a really nice uh, you know, use and where if you want to do some toasting of some some bread on one side or some buns while you're cooking on the other side, you can really give a lot of a lot of flexibility with those dual those dual uh, burners on the on the double griddle size. All right, so so that's one of the options that you can have in the kind of the use and care of the griddle. Um, it's one of my favorite appliances. I don't know what I would do without my griddle because it really does function better in many cases than professional griddles do. In, in restaurants, it's just so even and so consistent. It really makes life quite a pleasure to work with. Um, the other choice that you might have um, opted for on your, um, on your dual fuel range or on your sealed range top would be our gas char broiler, right? This is essentially an indoor grill. Um, and so um, we have, it's gonna be the same width as your, uh, your griddle or your burners, but it obviously gives you that outdoor flavoring of, uh, of, uh, of, of the food, right? So it's really like cooking outside. So Lynn, I'm gonna swing back over here to the 60 inch um, as we look about the dual fuel. So you can see that we have our dual fuel here, the 60 inch that has the, the char broiler on it, right? Obviously it's the same burner that we find underneath the infrared griddle, it is uh, that 15,000 BTU um, broiler. So it's powerful, not as powerful as an outdoor barbecue, but then again, we don't really wanna have those, you know, that really big smoky appliance in our kitchen. So we've made it a little bit less powerful, but it's still gonna give you a really nice uh, uh, flavor and, 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 and seasoning that you might normally get on, on a grilled item. So. Um, just want to talk a little bit about its construction. You're obviously going to have this um, grate that goes on top, but with your dual fuel, um, if you have the char broiler, you also have the option of using this deflector plate that goes into your on top of your char broiler. 
And what this deflector plate does is essentially create a small sear zone, a slightly hotter part of the grill or the charbroiler in the front, right? And then in the back, we have a, a, a plate that basically diffuses the heat and makes it a little bit cooler so that if you want to do some searing where you're getting a lot of really dark color on the outside of whatever it is you're cooking and then you want to move it to the back to cook it a little bit slower, you can use this deflector plate. Now the grill will function perfectly well without it. So you could remove it should you choose to and giving you a very even distribution of heat throughout the grill or through the charbroiler. But when you apply this, you see these little grooves that are near the front. Those are gonna fit onto that small flange of metal that's just right there in the middle. You're just gonna kind of set that on there. So now that's gonna deflect that heat. It's gonna channel that heat up to the front of the charbroiler so that as you're cooking a chicken breast or a steak or maybe a piece of fish, you're gonna get that extra browning and then you can move it to the back of the, the charbroiler in order to finish the cooking, All right? So that's a really nice feature of this. Again, it allows you to direct that heat, give you a slight two zone cooking um, surface, even on a smaller, um, uh, you know, kind of uh, grill. And then you obviously see this just fits in however you'd like, just drop it on top. And now you can just remember that when you're using your charbroiler, you have only one temperature setting and that is high. You can't adjust the heat. So once it's on, you want to give it probably somewhere between seven and 10 minutes to preheat the surface and make sure that those grill grates are nice and hot. So you're going to get a maximum amount of of marks and browning on the outside of your product, whatever you're cooking. So again, about seven to 10 minutes is generally an ample amount of time to get it preheated. You don't really need to coat any of the, of the grill grates with any sort of uh, cooking oils or fats or anything like that. Just um, make sure that you've got a slight film of oil on whatever it is you're cooking and then lay that onto the grill and then allow it to brown naturally. Remember like with all cooking processes, um, you want to let the food tell you when it's ready to be moved. If it, if it sticks at all, it's not ready to be moved. So just allow it to, to brown and mark perfectly and then turn it when it's released and naturally from the grill grate. But again, only has that one heat setting. So again, with the, with the deflate, deflector plate in, we've got a hot zone of about six to eight inches in the front and then a cooler zone in the back. Yes, Lynn. Question? No. Okay. <laughs> so again, this all these all come with stainless steel covers, so you don't have to look at it when you don't want to. Just you can put that right on top, so that you can see that it's nicely covered. Um, and then if you have um, the uh, the griddle or a double griddle, you can also you get um, a maple cutting board, which will also cover your griddle, um, whether it's a double or a single just so it gives you A, another workspace, and B, you don't always have to look at your beautifully seasoned griddle underneath it. So again, you can see the different configurations of all of these items, and they give you that real flexibility in your kitchen. So again, um, with the charbroiler and the griddle, just make sure you're preheating them properly. Minimal amounts of cooking oil is all it's gonna take um, in many cases, uh, and you're gonna find that they're gonna give you plenty of years of great service, all right? So that's all about the different gas configurations and the use of the, the gas burners. Let's talk a little bit about our induction dual fuel range. Now it's kind of funny to call an induction range sort of dual fuel, but we wanna cover induction because induction obviously also covers for people who have an induction cooktop, right? You may have the, it's not a, it's, well, it's a sealed burner of sorts. I mean, obviously nothing can go down into an induction range, but let's just talk a little bit about induction for those of you who have an induction range. This is a 30 inch induction range, so four burners. Um, there's also a 36 inch induction range, um, which comes with six burners. They both function also as cooktops. Um, so you have an induction cooktop in both sizes in addition to a 24 inch size. But What's really important is to talk about the control panel and how those function, because that's really um, gives you the, the replication of cooking on gas, right? One of the advantages of induction is when it's on, it's, it's on, um, and when it's off, it's completely off, and you're not having that lingering heat that you might have had on an electric cooktop. But just so we talk about the different um, use of these controls, because I think it's really important to note, right? You want to make sure you unlock um, the, uh, the, the, the panel by just holding down 
And when you hold down on these, just make sure that your finger covers not only the, the word that you're trying to adjust or the, or the burner that you're trying to adjust, but also just slightly above it as well. And press firmly, but not hard, right? Just enough to basically um, cover the whole thing, just like you might on a touch screen on a phone or something like that. But let's talk about when we're using this, when we're turning it on, um, we're going to um, control it by sliding up and down. Um, but what's important to remember about Wolf induction is basically how these burners are actually calibrated. Um, as you look on the panel, you'll see um, between the word simmer um, and high, there is a total of essentially 10 points that you can set the, uh, the, uh, the range to, the burners to. Um, generally, most people think that the, the fifth dot right in the middle is medium, right? In fact, in ours, you don't get to medium until you get to about the seventh dot or the seventh stop on the, on the scale. Um, so uh, points one through seven go from the very lowest to the middle range of power that are being provided to your individual burners. Only when we get to, st to stops eight, nine, and 10 are we talking about medium, high, and high. And this gives you an enormous amount of control over how much heat you're actually producing through the burner so that when you are going to do some cooking on the range, you don't need to preheat on those last three stops because that's incredibly hot. So the pan um, is going to be almost unusable um, after about five or six minutes. It's going to have gotten so hot that anything you place into that pan is immediately going to burn or or, or scald or sear in a way that you may not want. So generally speaking, it's always good to remember that if you're going to preheat a pan for doing some kind of quick saute, or maybe you're going to brown something or, or do a pan fry or something like that, you probably don't want to heat anywhere past that seventh dot on your scale. You want to only use those upper three when you're going to do some very, very high heat cooking, like a wok cooking, as we talked about on your uh, the gas ranges or your boiling water or some other liquid, you're definitely going to want to use those high settings there as well. So again, remember that one through seven, that's up to the middle point in terms of the power of the unit and eight, nine, and 10, that's medium high and the highest setting. So keep those things in mind. Um, remember that on all of your, um, your dual, on your uh, induction ranges, you'll see the bridge button, which basically will draw um, the power between these two burners to be identical and controlled by a single slide. So once they're both activated, we can then bridge the two and now only one slide controls both. So they're exactly equal in terms of the power output. So if we are using a griddle or some very large pan on these two, we're driving the power equally through them, through them both. Um, and then you also have a boost setting on both of your back burners. And this is going to be true on almost all induction ranges that those, those back burners that are going to have the boost setting on um, the boost adds somewhere between 500 and a thousand additional Watts to that particular burner for shortened increments of time and generally about 15 minute increments. It'll add that extra thousand Watts. What it will do, however, is borrow power from the other burner. So if I'm boosting this burner and I'm still working on the other three, I'm going to slightly decrease the amount of power that would be uh, applied in the other three burners. So when I boost, I'm always borrowing a certain amount of power from the remainder of the unit, but it's obviously going to be great for speed boiling something, or if I want to heat something very, very quickly, um, we want to use that boost setting and it will shut itself off automatically um, when we're done with boosting. You can't boost on the bridge, obviously, when you've bridged two burners, you can't boost one burner and not the other. That doesn't work um, that way. So, um, and then obviously you can lock and then any controls, um, uh, you, can, uh, you can change tone, volume, uh, and you can uh, set it so that it takes turns off the auto lock um, so that if you get frustrated because every time you come back to use your cooktop, the, the, the the, the, the panel has locked itself again because you weren't using it for a while. There's actually a way to turn off that auto lock so that you can um, not have to worry about having to unlock the panel each time. Um, this is great for people who don't have young children in their homes and things like that, and they don't want anything to inadvertently set off the induction range.
So, okay. So that's uh, that's a little bit about just the control of your induction range. Um, it's you know very very straightforward. Obviously, uh, most important just to remember how that scale works on the in terms of the uh, in terms of uh, temperature control. Really really important, right? Okay. So uh, let's talk just a little bit about how we care some of the products that I like to use for cleaning and care of these items. Um, very important. Um, generally speaking, you need a basic degreasing solution for any stainless or of the porcelain enamel on the, uh, on the, uh, on the dual fuel range, on the gas burners. You want to just use a basic degreaser to just clean off any of that grease. Should you have to do any more scrubbing, whether it's uh, a little boil over or maybe it's some sugar or some pasta sauce or something that cooks to the bottom of the, the pan. Um, I would only recommend the uh, the barkeeper's friend or the Bonami and then obviously a blue Scotch-Brite pad. That's all you're going to want to use for doing any kind of scrubbing, whether it's on the stainless or on the porcelain enamel or even on your induction top. You don't want to use anything harsher than those three items in order to get any cook, cooked on uh, spills or stains. It's really going to be the best way to go about cleaning those uh, when you need to. And that's going to be um, the easiest way. These are also, as I recommended last week, great ways for doing some, if you need to do a little cleaning on the oven interior where it's a small stain and you're catching it quickly before it has a chance to really bake itself onto your finish. Neither of these items will scratch or damage the finish in your oven. So you can always rely on that, doing that. So one of the things though I get a lot of uh, questions about is how do I clean the sealed burners on my range. So I don't know if Lynn will get you a, a close-up shot, but you can see that on the, the range burners, they have this aluminum portion down here at the bottom, um, which is the part that if you get a little spill or you get some food that gets on the outside of this burner, it will carbonize and kind of cook itself onto that surface. And that can be frustrating for many people. So what I always recommend that you do is go out and get yourself some of this product, which is called Carbon Off. It's basically available. You can get it online and or some restaurant supply stores as well. Um, you just use an old paintbrush. You brush it onto the stains that are on your burners and allow it to sit. Um, they'll tell you that you can let it sit for 15 minutes and that'll get stains off of it. Um, generally speaking, I always let it go at least two hours. And if, I, if I'm thinking ahead far enough, I can do it overnight and then just let it sit overnight. And then in the morning, come back with a small, with a little blue scrubby or even an old toothbrush and just scrub off the stain and wipe it away. And it's gone like it was never there. You can also use this product to clean spills and stains on the interior of your oven cavities without any risk of damaging the finish in your oven. So don't worry if you need to do a small stain inside your oven, right? If you have a little, you know, pie that, that, that bubbles over or fruit tart or some, you know, maybe a little lasagna boils over and you forgot to put some, you know, a, a baking sheet underneath your lasagna pan and you get a little tomato sauce on the floor of the oven and it cooks there. This will take it off without damaging your oven cavity and it's really easy to use. Just brush it on, like I said, with an old paintbrush, wipe it down. It works really, really well. So that would be a great way to just help do in-between maintenance on your, on your, um, on your, on your appliance. Um, so I'll get a lot of questions about what, how we clean the grates on the, um, on the gas ranges and also the grates from your charbroiler. Um, ideally, the best way to do that is to just do it in the sink with hot soapy water. Dish soap works great. Just get a brush, scrub it down. Don't put them in the dishwasher. Um, it's A, going to give them sort of an iridescent shine to it. Um, we've redesigned the bottom so that these little feet that we used to kind of fall out all the time. They don't fall out, but I don't really recommend you put these in the dishwasher. Again, just hot soapy water in the uh, in the sink will work best. Yes, question, Lynn. You can. So the car the question is, could I use carbon off, right? That uh, product um, on stainless steel inside of a convection steam oven? Yes, you can. Um, what I would recommend, however, is a quick segue into the convection steam oven for just a second. 
what I would start with in the convection steam oven is try a little bit of the barkeeper's friend and some hot, hot, hot water or the excess steam from running a cycle to try to get that stain off first. If that doesn't work, you can use the carbon off on the steam um, or on the stain in your convection steam oven. But I would try the barkeeper's friend first because I find that that stain cleans really easily. Okay, so same as we cleaned the grates for the for the for the burners and also for the charbroiler is the, your burner caps. You know, don't don't put these in the dishwasher. It's not like it's going to damage them. However, it is going to give them that kind of weird iridescent shine to it, especially because of the temperatures that we reach in the dishwashers and the powerfulness of those dishwashing detergents. It's going to kind of change the finish a little bit on your burner cap. So just wash these soap and water in the sink. It's gonna be the best way to care for those burners, um, burner caps and your burner grates as well, okay? Um, as I kind of talked about last week, um, one of my favorite products and one of the hardest things you'll ever find to clean about your dual fuel oven racks are, are the racks themselves, right? So if you see the Carbona, the two-in-one oven rack cleaner um, is a great way to, I think, annually clean your oven racks. You know, cleaning oven racks can be really, really painful, literally, um, with scrubbing those um, with a brush or with a, with, a, with, a, with a scouring pad or something like that. But this Carbona two-in-one oven rack cleaner, basically, it's a giant Ziploc bag. You put the, the racks in the bag. You add the contents of the bottle. You seal it. You let it sit overnight in your garage, on your patio, just anywhere that kind of out of the way. Um, and then the following morning, just put them in the sink and hose them down. And all that built up carbon and grease just washes right away and your racks look brand new. So it's a nice thing to do sort of, you know, in the winter when you don't have anything better to do and you've been through the holidays and your racks are kind of, you know, kind of gummed up a little bit from the grease, from the cooking of the different things during the holiday season. Great way to just do it once a year and clean that off. Right. And the last um, product I have up here is it's a griddle cleaning kit. And these are, and that's for those of you who you really want to keep that griddle looking like it's almost new. Um, and this comes with everything you would need to clean the griddle pretty much right back down to the metal. Um, it has a, a very powerful um, degreasing solution, which is applied to a hot griddle and then scrubbed off with a scouring pack, then squeegeed into that. Um, collection tray, which of course then it's discarded. Then all you have to do is wash the griddle down um, pretty thoroughly, I will say, um, after you've used the product on it, but that'll take your griddle back to an almost factory-like condition. You'll have to re-season it a little bit at that point as well. So it may require, instead of the full burn-in process, you may just be adding the oil to it as in the second step and just allowing it to cook for about 30 minutes just to get it um, back and, and seasoned again. It won't be as extensive as the, as the initial seasoning of the griddle, but it will, um, it will be required after you've used that chemical because it really does take the seasoning all the way off. And just be very aware that um, it's a very powerful chemical. You want to make sure your ventilation system is on full blast um, when you apply that to your griddle because it is going to create quite a, an aroma in your kitchen, if you will. And so, and that's a great thing to mention, you know, for those of you who have the gas, um, the, the gas on your dual fuels or the gas on your range tops, make sure that when you are going to use any of those surface burners, whether it be a plain burner or the griddle or the charbroiler, you should have your, your ventilation system running five minutes prior to when you turn that first burner on. This is gonna help get the ventilation system working at its maximum efficiency so that you're ventilating your kitchen, you're not having excess um, grease or, or food particles or anything like that landing in places you don't want them to. It's gonna direct that pattern of air up through your ventilation system. So five minutes prior to any burner ignition or surface burner ignition, you wanna make sure that ventilation system is running. It doesn't have to be on high, can be on medium, medium low, no problem at all. It's just going to help direct that air so you have less of the combustion uh, particulate floating around your kitchen and landing, you know, where you don't really want it to land. You'd rather have it go up the flue. Be a really nice way to do that. You know, for those of you who want to 
get a little information on use and care for your Sub-Zero product as well. We have that included in last week's video. It's near the end. So if you need to know about coil, cleaning, changing filters, changing air filters, that's all covered in last week's um, video. So you can always check out on your Sub-Zero uh, to see, to make sure how you're maintaining and taking care of that appliance as well. Um, Lynn, do we have any more questions uh, that we need to answer before we sort of... Okay, we'll give everybody a couple seconds to um, if they have any questions and certainly um, know that we are a, a, you know, a resource for you here at Roth. Um, if you have questions about the use and care or if you're having any you know, maybe mechanical issues, it's always a great idea to reach out to us first because we're sure to have somebody here with the, uh, with the expertise technically to help you um, or the connections to help you in the most expeditious manner possible. So we want to make sure that you guys reach out to us whenever you need that. And also, um, should you need more content about the use, and I'm going to talk about the use, I'm talking about recipes and different preparations for not just a dual fuel or, uh, or induction, but maybe it's in the convection steam oven or some of our other appliances, I always invite you to subscribe to our YouTube channel because there are lots of great videos from all the chefs and all the consultants here in the company. Um, not only describing um, the, the workings of our appliances, but also some really creative ways that you might want to use them, especially now we're about to put together a whole Thanksgiving and holiday package. So that'll be showing up soon on our YouTube channel with lots of fun recipes for the Thanksgiving Day holiday and then also the Christmas holiday as well. So we're going to have lots of great stuff on those two platforms, both YouTube and on Instagram. So Lynn, looks like you got a question. On stainless, unfortunately, once there is a scratch on stainless, I have yet to see a way to get it to go away. Um, so I don't, I don't know of a way um, at all to get the, the really nasty scratches. Um, where we gen generally see most of the scratches um, from stainless is from taking the grates off of the off of the ranges and then and kind of dragging them across the stainless. A lot of times these grates can make little tiny scratch marks right here at the back edge of the bull nose. So unfortunately, I wish I could give you a, a solution for that, but I don't have one. I don't know, Lynn, you don't know of one, do you? Let me ask, let me ask the information to you. They might okay, so we'll, uh, we'll definitely check with our customer relations folks and see if we can get something and we will post it up um, in the comments uh, to this video if we do have a link or some kind of a remedy for that uh, the small scratches on your stainless but I've never seen one but that doesn't mean they don't exist um, so you have any more questions No, and that's a great question. The question was about, do I have to worry about getting the carbon off on the black porcelain enamel of the, of the, of the uh, dual fuel range? You do not. The carbon off will not damage it. It is okay on painted surfaces like that, or on this, actually in this case, it's a, it's a powder coated surface. So it's not going to come off. If you get a little bit of the carbon off on the black, don't worry about it. Just wipe it off. When you wipe off the stainless, you don't have to worry about even leaving it there overnight. It's not going to have any impact on it. In fact, if you have a really bad stain, you can use the carbon off to get it off of the black as well. And that's why it's really good on your oven cavities as well in, in, the, in the oven cavity. Any more? Well, I want to thank everybody for joining us. If you're here in Denver, it's just starting to snow. So that's a, sort of a welcome sight. Um, so again, um, if you have any other questions, please feel free to reach out not only to myself, but to, to Lynn and the team here in the showroom. We're certainly happy to help you or in wherever you're joining us from, uh, the showroom that's closest to you, they'll have the same sort of expertise um, there as we do here in Denver, and they can certainly help you. Um, as well. So again, thank you so much. We enjoy everybody's 
uh, time and attention, and we look forward to talking to you again soon. So thanks so much.